good afternoon. Welcome. I am happy and I'm excited to be able to welcome you all to the fifth annual Senior Showcase here at the Z. Smith Reynolds Library. Um, I'm Molly Keener. I am the Scholarly Communication Librarian here at the Z. Smith Reynolds Library, and it's my pleasure to coordinate this program every year. Um, as I said, we're in our fifth year now, and the students who have joined us in the past to present, the students who are with us today to present, just blow my mind every year with the depth of their research, the interesting questions they pose, um, their high engagement in intellectual pursuits beyond the normal um, classroom uh, elements that we experience here at the university. So hopefully today um, you all are just as excited as I am to be here. Uh, from the beginning, the Senior Showcase um, really has been student focused. In fact, it was a student inspired idea. Five years ago, five and a half years ago, uh, we had a student who come to us and he actually went to Dean Sutton and he said, I have fellow students who are doing incredible research for their honors theses and nobody knows about this. What can we do? And what came to be was that Lynn put us together and we chatted and the student sh showcase um, is, is what evolved from that conversation, series of conversations. And so the, sho the showcase really is um, driven by students and it's one of the ways that we support our students and applaud them at the end of their time here at Wake Forest. We are sad that they are leaving, but all of them are launching on to great things afterward. Um, so it's sort of a nice farewell for them um, to know that they have been supported and honored um, by their faculty who have nominated them for their outstanding research, uh, by a panel of library faculty who have reviewed all of the research of the nominees and enjoyed debating and discussing um, all the different nominees and the works that they presented. And so I just invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today um, a little bit about how it's going to happen. I will introduce each speaker in turn. He or she will come forward to speak. We do ask that you hold questions until the very end. Um, at the conclusion, we will have a joint question and answer period and we'll have all four honorees this year come to the front. And then as you can see, we do have light refreshments. I encourage you to stay and chat with our honorees this year. Uh, get to know them just a little bit. If you have detailed questions about their work, uh, you can certainly stay to ask them the probing in-depth questions that maybe you're too shy to ask during Q&A. Um, so do plan to stick around for a while. Uh, so first up this year, we have um, David Enchauskas. David is double majoring in Spanish and religion. He is from Homer Glen, Illinois, and he will enter the novitiate of the Chicago, Detroit province of the Society of Jesus on August 16th, 2014. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. My name is David Inchauskas, and I'm going to be speaking to you today about liberation theology in Latin America, the dialogue between the liberation theologians and the Vatican. And I have a lot to cover, so please do bear with me. I'll be going really quickly. Um, so this is Father Franz van der Lute, and he was a Dutchman. And he had come to Syria to work with the poor and to work with those who had mental and physical handicaps. He arrived in the 1960s, and just a few days ago, on April 7th, an armed gunman came into his house and threw him out into the street and shot him in the head two times, and he died there with his people. Originally, when he arrived, there were about 6,000 Christians in his town, and now there are 60. So this man had said there's nothing more painful than watching mothers searching for food in the streets for their children. And this is relevant because it demonstrates that now liberation theology is not just something in Latin America. It's something that's taking place in the entire world. So to relate that, I'd like to read you uh, very briefly this passage from this book by Leonardo and Clodovis Boff, Introducing Liberation Theology, to, so that you might get a grasp on how the liberation theologians think. 
One day, in the arid region of northeastern Brazil, one of the most famine-stricken parts of the world, I, Clodovis, met a bishop going into his house. He was shaking. Bishop, what's the matter? I asked. He replied that he had just seen a terrible sight. In front of the cathedral was a woman with three children and a baby clinging to her neck. He saw that they were fainting from hunger. The baby seemed to be dead. He said, give the baby some milk, woman. I can't, my lord, she answered. The bishop went on insisting that she should, and she that she could not. Finally, because of her insistence, she opened her blouse. Her breast was bleeding. The baby sucked violently at it and sucked blood. The mother who had given it life was feeding it like the pelican with her own blood, her own life. The bishop knelt down in front of the woman, placed his hand on the baby's head, and there and then vowed that as long as such hunger existed, he would work to eradicate it each and every day of his life. And so this is what the liberation theologians did. They went to university, many of them were very privileged, and yet they decided to live their lives, and many of them died in solidarity with the poor. So that's why it's relevant today. Um, my thesis statement is this. As faith and reason purify each other of superstition and arrogance, the liberation theologians and the Vatican purify each other of presuppositions and of imprecision. The dialogical process that stretches from the 1890s to the present has refined the European and Latin American perspectives of their faults and their excesses. Now, you could say, David, this is very subjective language. Why would you choose words like faults and excesses? But uh, these aren't my words. Um, they're the words of the liberation theologians and the Vatican themselves. Both sides agree that this dialogue is important, and both sides feel that this dialogue has progressed. So who am I dealing with? Well, the Latin American liberation theologians I've chosen to deal with are um, Gustavo Gutierrez, Leonardo Boff, and John Sabrino. And I've chosen these three because they've decided to remain in continuity with the Catholic Church. So therefore, they have common categories that they share with the Vatican, so it's easier to work with them. Then the Vatican officials, um, I'm really looking at people from Leo XIII in the late 19th uh, century to the present day with Pope Francis. And then another body which is involved is the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is just the Inquisition renamed. Um, using less violence, though, these days. And that was a joke. I, now, the secular history, you know, we have the, the Spanish colonial period, obviously, uh, and then we have the neo-colonial period, but really we're focusing on the 50s and 60s and uh, afterwards. So in the 50s and 60s, there was a great increase in industrialization in Latin America. And this was largely due to um, dictator, sort of neo-fascist governments that took over. These are called uh, the populist governments, and Perón and Vargas are just two examples. And they really established relationships with North America and with Europe and developed trade agreements. And this led to a great increase in wealth in the cities, especially for the urban proletariat and for um, the middle class. But it also mar marginalized the peasants uh, because, to a large degree, Latin America was still feeling the effects of the feudal system, and even today. So, to respond to these populist governments, there developed popular movements in the 50s and 60s to combat them. And this is where liberation theolog uh, theologians really thrived. So I want to talk to you about the precursors to liberation theology. Where did they get these ideas from? They didn't come out of nowhere. Um, so really, with Leo XIII, this was the late 19th century. And he said two things, two very important things. First, he said communists are bad. Um, he says that they are leading to the overthrow of all civil society whatsoever. Um, and this is not something that ended. It, uh, all the way up until John Paul II and even until today, uh, popes have been making comments about the harms of communism. Then we also have, on the other hand, and this is less well known, that he condemned laissez-faire capitalism and with equal vehemence, saying that the rich were laying a yoke, a burden akin to slavery on the poor. So the liberation theologians weren't the first to criticize, uh, communi uh, to criticize capitalism, right? Now, then this continues, uh, Pius XI goes on to say, it's not just within the countries, it's also in an international problem. And this comes out of the Great Depression, which affected not only the United States, but Europe and Latin America. So we now see that there are connections that extend across the country's borders. Then John XXIII goes on to say, you know what, we want, governments to step in and to give protection to the poor, to develop social welfare programs, which again, you, you, people don't typically hear about this when they hear about the Catholic Church, but this is what John the 23rd was saying. And at Vatican II, 
to make this even more clear, they say, the church is apolitical, okay? We're not going to align ourselves with any one particular political party within a country, okay? And yet, we're asking for radical economic changes to take place, and we do this by reading the signs of the times. What's going on in Latin America? What's going on in your particular context? And how can we Christify that context with the gospel message? So that's what they're doing. Now, liberation theologians, I think, focus on five main categories, and I have them here for you. But I'm going to just talk about one for the sake of time, the reign of God. So John Sabrino, uh, he's thinking, what should I make the ultimate organizing principle of liberation theology? Is it going to be the kingdom of God, or is it going to be the resurrection? Well, okay, let's think about the resurrection. The resurrection is a great sign of hope. Jesus rose from the dead. That's great. Uh, when I die, I'm going to be risen from the dead as well, and I'll spend eternity with God. But that doesn't really help you too much in praxis, per se. I mean, you can't live that. I mean, you live with the hope, right? But So he chooses the kingdom of God because he understands that as Jesus understands it from his perspective, the idea is that it's, it's already here to a certain extent. It's not fully here, but it's already here, so we can work with that category, right? So what does he say the reign of God is? Well, he says it's the utopia of the poor, and this term is going to become very important in liberation theology. But I'd also like to share with you what the kingdom of God is not, and that's the institutional church. Uh, Sabrino says many bishops, cardinals, archbishops had aligned themselves with the oppressors, and rightfully so, I think. Uh, many of them had done this. And so he wants to make it clear that these people are not the kingdom of God. All right, so the institutional church needs to sort out its problems. But on the other hand, now you might be wondering, okay, what does this have to do with Jesus and God? I mean, I could just build uh, a kingdom. I can eradicate poverty. But he says this, the kingdom of God, above all, is a gracious gift. It comes from God kind of alone. But we have to make it our own. We have to appropriate it, and we have to live it. And so this comes down to how the liberation theologians, especially Sabrino, see Jesus. Jesus is the mediator, the ultimate mediator, the only mediator that will ever exist. But we're in the process of the mediation. And so we appropriate Jesus and his message and the Holy Spirit, which he gives to the church, and we're going to use that in order to achieve this mediation as much as is possible during our time here on earth. Uh, yeah, double press. Okay. Now, Gutierrez uh, says something very similar, but he says, actually, the whole purpose of liberation theology is to sort out what is the relationship between political, economic, and uh, social growth and the kingdom of God. That is the purpose of liberation theology according to the founder of the movement, Gustavo Gutierrez. And he says it means fighting for a just world, and fighting is a progressive word. It's ing. It's something that we're doing right now. We're in the process, carrying out this process of liberation for the poor. Now, Boff says something very similar, and just to make this clear, this is a great statement of what the liberation theologians think about the kingdom. It is, in a certain extent, incarnate in the historical liberations that are taking place right now and will continue to take place throughout the world until the end of time. But it's not full. The kingdom of God is not fully present and will not be fully present until the consummation. So, uh, oops, too far. All right, the first responders. Now, what did the CDF say about this when they started reading these writings, right? I mean, maybe they were happy, maybe they weren't. What did they say? Well, John Paul II says, you know what, uh, Sabrino, I can see it's great that you chose the category Kingdom of God, uh, very motivational, but really the ultimate liberation does not come from the Kingdom of God. It comes from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is what he said at the conference at Puebla, which was the second important Latin American bishops conference on this topic of liberation theology. The CDF, uh, the Inquisition people, uh, agree and say the liberation is accomplished by the death and resurrection of Christ. And they go so far as to say not just this, but the poor ought to think that the death and resurrection is the ultimate organizing principle of liberation theology. So they say, okay, I'm a poor person. They're putting themselves in the shoes of the poor person. They're saying, okay, I very much so want to be liberated from these unjust structures which are oppressing me. But at the same time, uh, really, it gives me great hope. And I trust that God will rise me, raise me from the dead even though I may die of poverty and starvation. So then John Paul II goes on to say, the liberation theologians are criticizing the institutional church. 
They want a people's church, a, per, a church which is fleshed out in the poor. That's their language, right? Now, John Paul II says, the church is not a democracy. The church is based on apostolic authority, which Jesus gave to his 12 apostles, and which is now present in the bishops and in the priesthood and in the ministry of the curia of the bishops and of the priesthood. Okay? Now, also sacramental life, and this is a big uh, distinction between liberation theologians and the Vatican. How do we view the sacraments? Do we, do we view the sacraments as a party celebrating the liberation of the poor? Do we, do we view the sacraments as a party celebrating the resurrection of our Lord? How do we view it? And we know that through the Catholic Church traditionally, the sacraments are handed down apostolically. Okay, and so it's through the bishops and the laying on of the hands on the priests, right, that makes these sacraments quote unquote effective, to use uh, mechanical language. Now, I want to go into and dwell, oh, I've got plenty of time. So I'll be able to talk to you a little bit more at length that's probably what you're interested in. What, does, what do the, the recent popes, oh, two, okay. What do the recent popes say about this? Uh, Benedict the Sixteenth and Francis, what do, they, what do they say about this? Well. Um, Benedict the 16th in his book Jesus of Nazareth says that Jesus is the kingdom of God in person now lest you think that this is a new idea it's not it, com it comes from origin okay one of the original church fathers Jesus is the kingdom of God in person and how well if you look at the road to Emmaus maybe some of you are familiar with this story how do these disciples find Jesus okay two ways one when he was expounding the scriptures, expounding the scriptures. They say that a fire lit up in their hearts when he was expounding the scriptures and teaching them the meaning of these passages from the Old Testament, right? And the other way they found it was in the breaking of the bread. Well, notice that the Mass is this. It is the liturgy of the Word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. So it's both aspects, right? And this is an aspect that is somewhat de-emphasized in liberation theology because remember, it's the priests who are going to do the sacraments, right? Not the poor. So the poor cannot just change, you know, the, the body, uh, the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus. Now, Benedict the 16th is often hated on for hating on liberation theology. But I'll let you know that that's not entirely true. He did side with liberation theologians on this point. That the church must be visibly, recognizably the community of God's poor. And notice the strong language he uses here. The church as a whole. And, and recognize this is what's happening in many bishops today. Uh, one of the bishops over in Scotland has just decided he's going to not live in his papal palace, he's going to live in the slums with his people. Um, and so this is coming from Benedict. Now, last slide, uh, maybe. We have Francis. What is he saying about this term utopia? The liberation theologian said that this is the utopia of the poor. That's what the kingdom is. Paul VI, in the uh, 60s and 70s, did not even use the word utopia in any of his writings. Okay? Benedict XVI actually says no to the utopia and says that utopia is not the word that we're going to use for describing the kingdom. He says that this false utopia is like an ideology or a human project. It's not what God does. It's not the gracious gift. But Francis is using utopia in a positive way, as I've shown in this quote here the brighter horizon of the utopian future. Now, you're not going to find that I know the word utopia in the, in the Bible. I mean, maybe it's there, I don't know. But uh, it's certainly not a word that is expressed with clarity, right, in the Bible, and yet Francis is using it. So I'd like to finish um, with this. Now, you're not going to say that Francis is entirely for liberation theology either. I want to nuance that a little bit, right? Because in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, which he just published uh, December or November, I think, uh, this past year, he says he actually requotes John Paul II from when he went to Puebla to so-called chastise liberation theologians. Okay, and so he says, we cannot present the gospel partially or fragmentary. We need to present it in its fullness. And so not only preach the kingdom of God, but also preach the resurrection and the sacraments. So to end, I would like to say this dialogue that has been taking place may seem to many of you to be very conflictive, and I think that's true. It is at certain moments in time. But both groups have come to understand that the dialogue is important, and it's leading them to further clarify their doctrines, and also is bringing the church closer to the poor in the various countries 
in which liberation theolo theology is thriving. So thank you so much for listening to the presentation. If you'd like to hear more about it, I'd love to send you the paper or talk to you about it personally. Thank you. Welcome to those of you who joined us uh, a little bit late. We're delighted that you are here. This is the fifth annual Senior Showcase. In case you found yourself in a room full of people you didn't know what was going on, we're glad you're here. This is what's happening. Our second presenter today is Rachel Cumbust, who is majoring in classical studies and minoring in Greek. Rachel is from Mobile, Alabama, and in the fall, she will be attending the University of Virginia to pursue a master's in education curriculum and instruction, gifted education. Rachel? Thank you, Molly. You've all probably heard the phrase, know thyself. Gnothe seauton. This is the mantra of classical Greek civilization. It's famously inscribed on the walls of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. It's echoed in the words of Socrates. It permeates the literature and the culture of the time. But how do we know thyself? What questions would you ask to arrive at the answer? What do you look like? What's your major? What are your strengths and weaknesses? What do you do? Who are you? This list could go on and on, but remarkably, during the 1,000-year period between about 800 BCE and 200 CE, the fundamental questions used to get at this notion of knowing thyself remained largely unchanged. What is your name? Where are you from? And who are your parents? Know thyself. These three questions recur throughout Greek and Latin literature, playing a vital role in the identification of characters and providing insight into the cultural notions of identity. Yet, until now, they haven't been studied systematically. So the first element of my project was establishing the presence and the consistency of these three questions in classical literature. For example, in Euripides' Ion, a fourth century Greek tragedy, Ion inquires about Creus' identity by first asking, who are you? Followed by the three questions, from what part of the world do you come? Who is your father? What name am I to call you? Creus in turn answers, Creus is my name, my father was Erechtheus, and my native land is the city of Athens. At the play's climax, Ion's identity is revealed through three tokens, each representing one of the three questions. Underscoring the centrality of identity to this play, this climactic moment of revelation occurs inside the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, upon whose walls are inscribed the words, Know Thyself. The three questions continue to be a common occurrence in later literature. In Plautus's The Brothers Menechmus, the three questions occur in the introduction and again in the final recognition scene. Several centuries later, the three questions are still present in the ancient novel, particularly in the works of Caraton and Heliodorus. Given the endurance of these, question, these three questions as a literary trope in both Greek and Latin literature, from classical Greece to imperial Rome, the remainder, and in fact the majority of my project, sought to identify Homer as the original literary venue for the expression of these three questions, and subsequently to analyze the three questions' presence and function in the Iliad. I found that the three questions occur 96 times in the Iliad and are used to describe 90 different characters. Most of these characters are identified through Homer acting as narrator, as you can see in this example, and Idomeneus slew Phaestus, son of Boris the Myonian, who had come from deep soiled Tarn. These descriptions are usually rather simple and formulaic, but their formulaity doesn't detract from their importance. Rather, it demonstrates the degree to which the three questions were established as a literary trope in Homer's writing, like epithets or epic similes. Among other functions, these simpler examples often help to establish a more emotive connection between the reader and the character being described. This is partly because so many of the characters are identified or named as they're slain or as they lay dying on the battlefield. 
As in later literature, the three questions also appear in dialogue, particularly in the context of duel or in one soldier's exhortation of another. In the first situation, the three questions are used to intimidate an opponent through boasting of one's honorable name, homeland, or parentage. In the second, the three questions are used to invoke the standards or expectations that are implicit in one's name, homeland, or parentage. Thirdly, the three questions occur in dialogue that is far removed from these brief interchanges on the battlefield. These instances of the three questions are usually more, uh, more complex, less formulaic, and more intimately connected with deeper notions of self-realization and knowing thyself. Two crucial scenes of the Iliad, Helen at the Scaean Gates and Priam at the foot of Achilles, are both powerful examples of the three questions functioning in this context. Um, I'll return to one of these in a little bit. In order to really grasp the meaning of the three questions as a whole, it's helpful to look at the impact of each of them individually. I'll only explain my work on one of them here, but feel free to ask me about them afterwards. So name, in its simplest form, the meaning is constituted by its etymology. But determining the etymology of a name is not always a simple matter. The name Penelope exemplifies two different ways that etymologizing can be done. Ancient sources su suggest that Penelope's name is derived from the cunning trick that she famously plays on her suitors, weaving Laertes' burial garment by day and unraveling it again each night. Thus the words pe uh, peine, meaning thread, lopto to tear out, lepto, strip off, or lope, covering a robe, compose her name. A more scientific approach to the name's etymology, on the other hand, suggests that Penelope's name is derived from the name of a certain kind of bird, the penelops. The former indicates that the original audience thought Penelope's cunning was such a central aspect of her character that it must be reflected in her name. The latter reflects the historical notion that a lot of feminine names during this time period were based on the names of birds. Both of these help shape our understanding of Penelope's identity. Through etymologies, a character's name can communicate a much greater meaning than a simple reading might indicate. But um, a character's name in a broader sense touches on deeper notions within self-realization. Name, particularly in the lives of Homeric heroes, comes to be synonymous with a lasting legacy, fame, or in some sense, immortality. When Odysseus comforts Achilles in the underworld, he speaks to the perseverance of Achilles' name. You did not lose your name when you died, but always, among all men, your glory will be good, Achilles. A hero's name is the emblem of his achievements, and its perseverance through time, even beyond death, is commensurate with the perseverance of the hero's glorious deeds. Yet, the necessity of this function of name for the Homeric hero is itself a reminder of one's mortal nature. Though one's name can be propelled into the everlasting memory of generations to come, a mortal body, even that of a godlike Homeric hero, cannot live forever. In this way, the first of the three questions, what is your name, serves both to identify characters through etymologies and related narratives, and also to touch upon deeper notions of self-realization and knowing thyself, um, specifically the struggle against and acceptance of one's nature as mortal. This is just a sample of the breadth of meaning that can be derived from each of the three questions. So with this in mind, I'll return to one of the more interesting and important examples that I mentioned earlier, Priam at the feet of Achilles. In this important passage, the three questions are much more than a simple introduction or formula. In case you're unfamiliar with the story, or maybe you just need a refresher, at this point, Achilles has reached the climax of his rage. He's just slain Hector, the leader of the Trojan people and the man who killed his dear friend Patroclus. In a desire for revenge and acting upon his godlike wrath, Achilles continues to mingle and maltreat the body of Hector instead of allowing for a proper burial. Priam, the father of Hector and king of Troy, is overcome with grief, and so he finally decides to go to Achilles and attempt to retrieve the body of his son. Note also that Achilles' wrath is the driving force of the Iliad. Wrath or manin or rage is the very first word. So the way in which this wrath is assuaged is a crucial aspect of the narrative. Grasping Achilles' knees in supplication, Priam begins, Remember your father, godlike Achilles, whose years are like mine, on the grievous threshold of old age. Him too, likely enough, those who dwell round about are treating evilly, nor is there anyone to ward harm and ruin from him. 
But he, at least, when he hears of you as still living, rejoices in his heart and hopes day by day to see his dear son returning from the land of Troy. Respect the gods, Achilles, and take pity on me, remembering your own father. With these words, Priam appeals to Achilles' parents, homeland, and name. First and most notably, he asks Achilles to remember his father. He then mentions those who dwell around, calling to mind the homeland that Achilles has left behind. Lastly, he speaks of the good news that sustains the aging Peleus, news of Achilles' name. Achilles responds first with grief, and then with a newfound awareness of his mortality and of the dire consequences of his formerly unquenchable and godlike wrath. Following this interaction, Achilles returns Hector's body to Priam, and the two then eat and lie down for sleep. In this passage, the godlike wrath of Achilles is assuaged through Priam's invocation of Achilles' name, homeland, and most importantly, his parentage. Through these three questions, Priam entreats Achilles to know thyself. Know that you are the son of the aged Peleus. Know that you are Greek. You don't belong in Troy. Know that your name is secure and your glory will live beyond your years. Know that, though godlike, you are mortal, you are human, and you are capable of empathy. And it works. Hector's body is returned and Achilles' wrath is assuaged. So why is all of this important beyond the context of Homer's Iliad? First, there's the broader notion of using literature and other resources of the humanities to learn about what it means to be human, the nature of humanitas. Um, this is an incredibly valuable and exciting pursuit, particularly whenever the subject is something as fundamental as the notion of identity or um, knowing thyself. <coughs> In addition, this project calls to mind the practice of reflecting on what questions we allow to speak for our identity. What do you look like? What's your opinion on X, Y, or Z? What do you do? Know thyself. It's difficult, but these three questions, immortalized by Homer in centuries of classical literature, are a good place to start. What is your name? Where are you from? Who are your parents? Looking just at the three questions themselves, you see first that they are stable, established aspects of identity. They are not situational. These characteristics are not a temporary, are not temporary pe preferences, paths, or persuasions. Um, name, parentage, and homeland, in their most essential sense, are aspects of our identity that are deeply rooted in the past. Secondly, they are universal. They unite us as humans. Everyone does have a name, homeland, and parents, whether or not we know them. This is apparent in how so many of our movies and books, particularly those for young people, revolve around the finding or discovering the answer to one of these three questions. Even when the answer is unknown or requires a heroic quest to be found, it still exists. And lastly, though they do unite us, the three questions also powerfully bring to light our differences, our unique identities. Each of us has a different trio of answers. So what is your name? Who are your parents? And where are you from? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Today's third presentation is from Ryan Whittington. Ryan is from Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, and is double majoring in music and German. He will begin studies for his master's in musicology at Florida State University in the fall, after which he plans to pursue doctoral studies. Ryan? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. This summer I received the Richter grant to conduct research at the Arnold Schoenberg Center in Vienna and a Boatler Prize from the Department of Music to travel to Venice and interview Schoenberg's daughter, Nuria. This afternoon I'll present you a subset of my honors thesis. Now, we'll be talking about music, so it's very important that we hear some of it. This afternoon, um, I want you to listen to the opening of the piece by Schoenberg that I'll be talking about today. Think to yourself about how this short clip makes you feel. What sort of adjectives would you use to describe what you're hearing? 
And how, do, how does this sound to you? So I don't know what kind of adjectives you have in your head, but Schoenberg titles this movement anmutig, which means dainty or charming. Arnold Schoenberg, born in Vienna in 1874, was one of the most important composers of the 20th century, and his importance continues. Best known for his 12-tone music, an innovative method of composing which treats all 12 tones of Western music as equals. I will focus on his early compositional process using this method, which he called the method of composing with 12 tones related only to one another. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think the name should go on a t-shirt. <laughs> Central to his composing and his life was Schoenberg's dedication to innovation and creativity. His ideas, designs, and compositional techniques were all informed by a stark allegiance to common sense. My special interest is his penchant for tinkering to create clever, practical solutions to everyday problems. My thesis is that Schoenberg's penchant for tinkering influenced his 12-tone method and music that began in the 1920s, an example of which you just heard. He was not a constructor. He was not a mathematician. He was an intelligent man and a terribly curious man, but he was the same naive, creative artist as all of the other composers. Eugen Lehner, a student of Schoenberg's and a member of the Kolisch String Quartet, which premiered several of Schoenberg's works, made this statement that hints at my thesis. First, a brief overview of Schoenberg's 12-tone method, very brief, so hang on to your hats. 12-tone composition begins with the basic set, the determined succession of the 12 chromatic pitches on which the composer bases the entire musical work. By manipulating this basic set, or row, the composer creates the pitch material for an entire piece, and thereby, in Schoenberg's view, achieves the ultimate compositional goal, unity and comprehension. Schoenberg borrowed devices from counterpoint to, in, to define several fundamental operations and procedures in 12-tone composition. The tema, or tonica, in German represented the basic set. The composer can transform this basic set in three different ways. First, read the basic set backwards, yielding the retrograde, or Krebs. Second, read it upside down, as if you flipped it across an x-axis. This yields the inversion, or umkehrung, Third, the inversion can be read backwards, yielding Umkehrung Krebs, or the retrograde inversion. Any of these three transformations, as well as the basic set, can then be tran uh, transposed to begin on any of the 12 chromatic pitches. Thus, from one row, you have 48 different transformations to use in the musical composition. Schoenberg's 12-tone method affirms that no one pitch is more important than any other. Once a pitch is left, it cannot be repeated until all the other 11 pitches of the set have sounded, with a few exceptions, of course. Furthermore, Schoenberg was always flexible with these rules. Again, Eugen Lehner tells the story of working with two colleagues to analyze the entire third string quartet of Schoenberg's. They found two places in the work where Schoenberg's note choices did not fit the expected succession of the row. After showing this to Schoenberg, Quote, Schoenberg got mad, red in the face. If I hear an F sharp, I will write an F sharp. If I hear an F natural, I will write an F natural. Just because of your stupid theory, are you telling me what I should write? Note that Schoenberg says your stupid theory. <laughs> Schoenberg saw himself as, quote, still more of a composer than a theorist. When I compose, I try to forget all theories, and I continue composing only after having freed my mind of them. It seems to me urgent to warn my friends against orthodoxy. 
Indeed, the man and his method marry heart and mind and should not be limited by being restricted to either heart or mind. Schoenberg, ever the inventor, made devices to help him manipulate the basic set. The devices range from a simple chart to slide rules, cylinders, and turntables, among many others. All these devices were created by Schoenberg himself and were used to compose and solve specific musical problems and situations. The need in the music led to the invention. The invention did not lead to the music. Let me show you now two devices that typify Schoenberg's commonsensical approach. Here is one of Schoenberg's cylinders, upon which strips of staff paper can be adjusted to form a certain row, after which it can be rolled back and forth across, say, a tabletop, and this transposes the row to begin on any of the 12 chromatic pitches. Here now is one of his turntables, consisting of concentric discs that yield the row and the inversion, that is, the row turned upside down. The innermost disc consists of the chromatic scale ascending clockwise by half step. The next larger disc contains numbers corresponding to the basic set and theoretically could be interchanged so that this turntable could work with any composition in any row. The next larger disc consists of the chromatic scale descending clockwise by half step. When the numbers are lined up with the inner disc, the basic set is the result. When the numbers line up with the outer disc, the inversion is the result. This uh, example is rather difficult to explain verbally, so if you want, um, I have a model of it made to scale. So if you want to see that after the presentation, feel free to do so. Schoenberg's mind was always active. The Schoenberg children tell how their father was simultaneously involved in a discussion with his composition students in one room and an avid debate about a pastry recipe that was happening somewhere else in the house. With this in mind, it's not surprising that he could be a teacher, writer, composer, designer, painter, etc., all simultaneously. Schoenberg was constantly designing. His ever-creative mind also actively made devices for other parts of everyday life. One example is his coalition chess, or coalition schach. He redefined the rules of chess as he did the rules of music. In his new version of chess, the board has 100 squares as opposed to the traditional 64, and a set of all new pieces are commanded from all four sides of the board. The lesser powers and greater powers form coalitions in order to win the game. Schoenberg also designed many forms of music stands, including one stand for an entire string quartet. He also designed a coat closet for a tennis locker room, a model of a chair that unfolds into a library ladder, and my favorite example, in 1926, Schoenberg's dentures no longer fit him. So he made a model of his mouth and his dentures to show and, and convince a disbelieving substitute dentist of his problem. The composer's penchant for hands-on designing and inventing, little known or written about before my work, my advisor told me to put that in there, <laughs> now informs my expectations of the music. It was for the Woodwind Quintet Opus 26 that the turntable was created. Schoenberg realized this 12-tone method solved a problem he had had in his previous method of composing. Using his 12-tone method, he could now create works with large-scale discrete movements absent a tonal center. Opus 26 is the first example of this and provides many illustrations of Schoenberg's manipulating his theory with the utmost flexibility. Due to time, I will only show you a couple of illustrations from the music. If you'd like to see more, I assure you that there are more, feel free to ask me after the presentation. In movement two, Schoenberg uses an oscillating pattern as a transitional point between sections and also at the end of the movement. In this pattern, Schoenberg divides the 12-note basic set into four three-note groups and gives a different group of three to each instrument. These groups of three rock back and forth on themselves until the pattern ends, seeming to violate Schoenberg's rule that notes cannot be repeated once they're left. 
The example further illustrates that Schoenberg views the inner segments of the row as discrete units and gives himself the freedom to rearrange them as he wants. I'll play this for you now. In the third movement, the composer convolutes the row here by reordering the pitches as follows. 1, 6, 7, 12, 2, 5, 8, 11, 3, 4, 9, 10. Illustrated here is a sketch for the third movement in which a strange doodle can be found in the bottom margin of the page. Beside it, Schoenberg also wrote a message that reads, Ich glaube, Goethe musste ganz zufrieden mit mir sein. In other words, I believe Goethe would have to be rather satisfied with me. <laughs> the relationship between this statement and Opus 26 is still unknown, but I have a couple of guesses I'll keep to myself for now. What I can explain, however, is the doodle. If you lay out the numbers 1 through 12 across the middle of the doodle, it actually illustrates the movement from pitch to pitch involved in such a reordering of the row that Schoenberg did here. The new row begins at 1 and ends at 10, highlighted here in gray. While it might seem that this is a newly composed row, Schoenberg believed it to be just another transformation of the original row in accordance with his theory of the unity of musical space. That is, as long as there's an explainable manipulation of the basic set, it can be manipulated broadly without creating disunity in the music. I'll play the introduction of movement three now for you. Listen for the reordered row appearing in the horn part. These examples and more in Opus 26 illustrate that Schoenberg the theorist consistently bent his method to the will of Schoenberg the composer. As he explained to Eugen Lehner, the method is not supreme. Rather, the composer's craft must artfully manipulate the method to yield the desired results, i.e. heart and mind. Schoenberg's 12-tone music is more than mere calculation with chilly precision, as if by an algorithm. Rather, it is full of beauty, marked throughout by Schoenberg's deep commitment to create only that which he heard as an artist and as an intelligent and terribly curious man. Thank you. Our final presentation this afternoon is from Christopher Earle, who is double majoring in economics and history. Christopher is from North Attleboro, Massachusetts, and will begin law school at William & Mary in the fall. So my thesis project is entitled, Mission Impossible, an Economic Analysis of Guilford County's Distinctive Pay for Performance Program. Now my journey to beginning this project is really a great uh, Wake, Forest, uh, a Wake Forest story. Every student in the room knows that situation where you have 12 credit hours all locked up, and you're looking for that one elective that'll get you to the 15-hour course load. But all the electives you had in mind get filled up, and you're wound up stuck taking an Education 201 class with Dr. Baker, <laughs> thinking that you're going to be learning how to teach kindergartners and first graders, <laughs> and wondering how that'll ever apply later in life. But then, as you dig into the curriculum, you start to unearth passions that you realize weren't there, that you hadn't dug into before or even realized or thought about. 
and at the same time, students that you're friends with are getting heavily involved in Students for Educational Reform, which is a really thriving organization on campus. And at the same time, the North Carolina governor's election has just taken place in which educational reform is a central issue. You start realizing that education isn't about learning how to be the best teacher. It's about reform and learning about policy, learning about how to structure a classroom to get the most possible student achievement and student, best student outcomes possible. And this led me to look deeper into the issue of teacher pay for performance. And what this is really is linking teacher pay with student achievement. And how do we do that? The most common way is through student test scores, which are most often come in the form of standardized statewide or countrywide examinations. Among economists, however, the real question of does teacher pay for performance work, the answer is really ambiguous. In the literature, we see some studies and experiments that have shown that yes, teacher pay for performance does stimulate better student outcomes, better student learning, and that it does make teachers um, you know, more happy in doing so. We've seen literature that's sort of ambiguous, where we're not quite sure. And then we've seen the other side that said student or teacher pay for, teacher pay for performance isn't actually all that is uh, um, put on to be. So looking at the arguments for teacher pay for performance, we see the positive arguments. We value hard work and results, and our capitalist system hinges upon rewarding such results. In this room, everyone's had a great teacher. We can all look back and think about the teachers that have really made a difference in our lives, teachers that unearthed passions and, and really um, stimulated a desire to learn in the classroom. And then we can also think of the bad teachers we've had, teachers who we wish had gone a little bit further in their instruction. And something is unsettling to us when we realize that at, if those teachers had the same degree from the same school and have been teaching as long as the other, that they'd be paid equally. The better teacher should make more money. That just makes sense to us. Some of the other arguments are that incentivized teachers will work harder and produce better results, and that merit pay programs will help retain and recruit the nation's brightest minds into the teaching profession. On the flip side, we see negative arguments for teacher pay for performance. And one of those main arguments is that goodwill and cooperation between teachers will be compromised. If all teachers are fighting for one single pie of a teaching salary, obviously they lose incentive to help one another out give tips about how to handle a troublesome student in the classroom, um, how to approach a unit that many students seem to struggle with. That desire for cooperation could perhaps go away if all teachers were fighting over who's going to get which students to test the best. Um, of course, success is difficult, if not impossible, to define and measure. Are we really comfortable with linking teacher salaries and teacher career projections on eight-year-olds taking tests in the morning with number two pencils? some of which are perhaps so poor that they haven't eaten breakfast that morning because their families can't afford it, that might be a little unsettling as well. And finally, high stakes merit pay systems would inevitably encourage dishonesty and corruption. In multiple school systems throughout the country where teacher pay for performance programs have been implemented, we've seen teachers that have been teaching to the test. And that's really the lowest level of dishonesty and corruption you can imagine. We've seen instances where teachers have actually gone into student test booklets and changed answers because their salary depends on it. Let's turn our attention to Guilford County, North Carolina. And for those of you who aren't aware, Guilford County is our neighboring county. Um, so it covers the greater Greensboro and High Point areas. It's got over 71,000 students and over 100, and 122 schools. And one of the main traits of Guilford County is that we see a wide variance between high and low performing schools. They're schools that consistently outperform North Carolina state averages and are ranked as exemplary schools based on a ranking system that was first implemented with President George W. Bush's No Child Left Behind Act in 2001. On the other side of that, we see schools that consistently underperform, and typically those are the schools with the highest concentrations of economically deficient students. Now, all of this really begs the need for reform, and that's where Mission Possible comes in. Mission Possible is a teacher pay for performance program initially chartered as a three-year pilot program in 2006. Now, a big thing to note is that North Carolina doesn't have teachers unions. So the teachers that were a part of Guilford County and were having this program implemented in the schools and the classrooms they were teaching in didn't quite have a say about how their salary was going to be structured or how they were going to be paid based on the results of these tests. And so negotiations took place between district officials and the Guilford County Board of Education. Schools were selected to participate in this pay for performance program based on three categories. And that was having a high concentration of economically deficient students, students who qualified for free or reduced price lunch, 
uh, recurrently high teacher turnover rates, and a record of failing to meet expected growth outcomes based on North Carolina's system of ranking schools and getting kids to the appropriate outcomes they need. In order to fund this program, uh, Guilford County collected over $2 million in local funding from budget cuts and reductions. Now, digging into this a little bit more, Guilford County actually fired 30 teaching assistants and consolidated many of their fifth grade classrooms in order to pay for this program. In addition, through President Obama's Race to the Top initiative, the school received a Teachers Incentive Fund grant, which was basically the federal government saying, if we see a program implemented that has a pay for performance element to it, we'll provide a subsidy or grant to help you um, fund that program. And then additionally, a local community business group also donated to help fund the program. So in order to collect my data to answer the question, did Mission Possible work? I took achievement data that was issued publicly via the North Carolina School Report Cards website. Also, I found out pretty much any and all information I need to know about Mission Possible through the Guilford County Schools website. They do do a very good job of keeping everything streamlined and um, showing to kind of a layperson what the program is all about and what sort of things go into it. And I collected information from 38 schools treated with Mission Possible at some point, 10 untreated schools from Guilford County, and 10 untreated schools from our county, Forsyth County, as control groups. And I collected data over a span of 11 years, from 2001 to 2011. An important point to note is that yes, Guilford County was, or yes, Mission Possible was started in 2006, but different schools came into the program in waves. So the 2006 would have been wave one, another wave was put in in 2008, and then another wave in 2011. In order to construct my model, I used a dependent variable, which was the school's passage rate for a given year and outcome, minus the state of North Carolina's average passage rate for that year and outcome. So what does that mean? Say we have Smith Elementary School in 2001. We take the passage rate of students in Smith Elementary School for a reading comprehension. 70% passed that test. Whereas in the state of North Carolina, the average passage rate for that test was maybe 72. The uh, dependent variable for that one data point would be negative two. The model statement below shows the X vector containing all of my control variables. So I took things like the percent of students who were on reduced lunch in the school being tested, all the way up to the number of board certified teachers in the school, the teacher turnover rate, and obviously you can read what else went into there as well. While the Z vector can train my dummy variables for the school region and the school type. Guilford County divides their schools into five different districts, um, and so I wanted to see if Mission Possible perhaps affected one district differently or um, yeah, differently than another and whether Mission Possible affected middle schools versus elementary schools differently. And here are the results of the base model regression. Now you can see on the ever Mission Possible variable for both reading comprehension and mathematics, we have negative 6.123. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you were a school ever treated with Mission Possible, you can expect to have over 6% of your students falling below the North Carolina state average on a given outcome, so reading comprehension or mathematics. And that's good. That shows that these schools that went into Mission Possible weren't randomly selected. They were schools that had been performing below expectations and you know, were treated with the program because of, of their problems they were having. But then we look at the top of these two boxes and we see Mission Possible. And what we want to see here, if the program is working, are positive metrics. And in, especially in reading comprehension, we actually see a negative, which is not good. That means that with treatment of Mission Possible actually being treated, we can expect a divergence from the North Carolina state average of negative 1.618, which is significant at the 90% level. For mathematics, we do see a positive number. So there does seem to see, con we do seem to see convergence with the state averages. However, that number is not statistically significant from zero. So it's possible that Mission Possible it's possible that Mission Possible didn't actually stimulate any positive outcomes, and perhaps with reading comprehension, may have actually stimulated negative outcomes. In addition to the base model, we looked at some different auxiliary models. We, you know, we wanted to run different regressions and see what actually went into these numbers. And so the first step I did was I divided middle schools and elementary schools in the sample. And what we found is the reading negative that we saw in the last slide was really driven by elementary schools. It seemed like Mission Possible negatively or disparately impacted elementary schools more so than middle schools with the reading variable. And it's possible that the positive that we saw in math came from middle schools. Now, a big factor with that is that middle school math teachers were um, 
in the lowest supply of any uh, subject that you could possibly imagine in Guilford County. They had middle school teachers that were supposed that had their certificates teach kindergartners teaching middle school math. Um, there was a school in the sample actually that didn't have a middle school math teacher. Um, so you can imagine the incentives that they had to put in and the salary boosts that they had to put in to get teachers to come and to teach math to these troublesome schools. And so that possible positive would be a great thing. Um, one big thing I did notice was that Mission Possible did seem to lower teacher turnover rate, particularly with the middle school math variable that I talked about. Some of these schools were turning over 50% of their teachers that in a given year. So half the teachers that are teaching in a school leave the next year. Mission Possible came in and reduced almost all of those numbers, and so that was a good thing if the teachers that are staying are actually good teachers. <laughs> Finally, uh, or well, the next step, uh, Mission Possible, because of budget constraints, paid different teachers in different schools in different ways. They had an automatic bonus would, for certain schools where if you just came to the school and taught a subject that was going to be, that had been a troublesome subject in the past, that you would receive a bonus just for signing up to teach that class. Other schools, they had an earned salary stipend where a value added metric would be calculated and if you were to rank as a very good teacher, you'd receive an X amount of salary based on how much better you were than other teachers in the area. Um, so it was kind of interesting that different schools had those different pay structures, but I didn't really find any different effects um, between the two, although I did see a possibly positive effect of bon the bonus incentive on math. So perhaps just signing up for middle school math showed how great of a teacher you were and that you were willing to take this challenge and, and teach these students that um, had been struggling in the past. Finally, I used the passage rate of disadvantaged groups. So students who are on reduced price lunch, black and Hispanic students. I used those as a dependent variable to see Mission Possible's effect on them. And I saw no significant effect of Mission Possible on any of the groups um, to even the lowest level of statistical significance. And finally, one big thing I noticed through all the regressions I ran was that poor students and having students who are on free and reduced lunch in your schools matter. And it can be detrimental to the school. Um, there was almost a direct correlation or inverse correlation between the number of poor students or percentage of poor students you had um, taking tests to the outcomes and achievement metrics that you saw. So final thoughts, uh, the program is still operable this school year um, with a budget that exceeds over five million dollars. And initially the, the funding came through budget cuts and reductions and now it's being um, funded through your tax dollars and our tax dollars. Um, which is interesting, you know, if this program really isn't working, are we pleased where our tax dollars are going? Uh, but there does seem to be general satisfaction among teachers and district officials. The quote up here from the superintendent says, I would certainly say it, it being mission possible, is working in some regards. Finally, uh, talking about some other points um, that were important in the, the thesis is, I do have data constraints. Um, I started in 2001 which is when the North Carolina school report cards started coming out per the um, No Child Left Behind mandates, and I went up to 2011. Think about how much of an overhaul your school would have to go through to change from a regular system to a pay for performance program. We could certainly see some lag on the pay for performance where, in fact, uh, Mission Possible may end up really working and really showing results this year, but I didn't get to test those because the data wasn't quite available yet. Uh, also, the way that North Carolina measures whether or not you pass the test is quite interesting. You're placed on a level from one to four, where you have levels one, two, three, and four. Levels three and four are considered passing. Levels one and two are considered not passing. It's quite possible that students moved from levels one to level two, or from levels three to level four, but would still be considered passing or not passing. So that's also important to note as well. And even though we saw a negative um, coefficient on the mission possible math, it's possible that a downward trend was stopped. Um, imagine, if you will, um, a divergence from the state average that looks like this. Mission Possible may have actually made it like that. And although it's not, not quite um, what we'd want to see, perhaps stopping that, that dangerously scary downward trend is actually a good thing. Finally, um, the, the structure for how teachers found out how much they were going to be paid in a given year, or what bonus they were going to earn, is very complex. It all gets put into this very complex formula about how much value you add to a classroom and how much knowledge a student gained in your being, by being in your class from the last year to this year. Um, so it was very complicated for teachers. You know, they couldn't say, if 80% of my students pass this test, I'll get this much money. And maybe that's a problem that they need to consider. 
Um, looking forward for further research, um, obviously, as I mentioned, it would be nice to get more data years after Mission Possible has come through. Um, so hopefully the North Carolina um, school report card will update the, the previous two years that I wasn't able to capture and perhaps could run the regressions again and maybe see if the, um, the lag effect actually went through and this program is actually doing some positive things in our schools. to invite um, our four speakers to come forward and sit in these chairs and open the floor to questions from the audience for any of the four. Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, what brought me to Vienna at, at first was just submitting a proposal for the Richter Grant because there was an art exhibit at the Arnold Schoenberg Center, which is where uh, all of Schoenberg's documents are housed right now. Even if there's something that's elsewhere in the world, they have a copy of it there. So it, it's a wonderful center. Um, but in the description of this art exhibit, one artist was responding to a recurring circle motif in the life and works of Schoenberg. I'd never heard of anything like this, and I couldn't find any scholarly articles, any work done on it, so I went to investigate that. Well, what I found is the reason there are no scholarly articles about it is because it's completely false and erroneous. It <laughs> doesn't exist. Um, it's just something that he thought up and this artist decided, oh, there's a recurring, no, there's not, no. Um, but I in the exhibit, because he was talking about circles, the archivists and curators of the exhibit pulled out some inventions that Schoenberg had made that dealt with circles. Th one of them was the turntable. And in the exhibit is the first place that I saw that turntable. So after the recurring circle motif was a bust, uh, I ended up uh, working with uh, these inventions and, and I got to hold and, and play with some of them and figure out how they worked. Uh, and that led to this, this discovery of the commonsensical approach about Schoenberg's method, which people seem to think is so brainy and so mathematical and it's all, it's all math, it's, all, it's like a computer program. The composer really doesn't have to do anything uh, it's not artistic, which isn't true. And if you look at the common sense behind it and the inventions, I think it proves that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, um, David, do you think that it's possible that liberation theology might have more to do with improving situations in Winter County schools? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> in some. I could elaborate or not. Uh, no, uh, I think that largely in the United States we've accepted capitalism as the norm. And I think that 
I have some serious questions about the value of capitalism in the United States, and I think that we should, along with the popes of the late 19th and early 20th century, try to qualify some of these things and see if capitalism is serving people. Because at least in Catholic theology, and I think in good philosophy, uh, everything is done for the betterment of the human race. And so we say capitalism um, is good, and maybe some people have reasons, but I would like to hear very explicitly and with research done and maybe using some of the philosophy to support it, what is it about capitalism that makes humanity better? Uh, businesses, um, I've been told that our business school teaches things like uh, what is the purpose of business? And the purpose of business is to please the shareholders. Uh, professors are teaching this at this university. But um, I personally think that that is not the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to benefit humankind. And so business should be of the people, by the people, and for the people, just as uh, government is. That's, that's my personal opinion on that topic. Um, yes, they did. Uh, they so France, the Jesuits, for example, yes, great example. Um, gosh, well, the Jesuits have, uh, the, the superior generals of the Jesuits have uh, provided some guidance on liberation theology. Uh, Adolfo Nicolás is, is one example. And uh, the previous superior generals have also offered guidance. Um, in the 60s and 70s, I think that what was said in the period that I was discussing is that Jesuits need to be very careful when they apply Marxist category. I didn't really go into the Marxism as much, but the Marxist categories that are being used in liberation theology, we need to be very careful when we use those categories because underlying Marxism is philosophical materialism and atheism, right? And so... Um, though Marxism is good in the sense that its purpose is for the benefit of humankind, um, some of those assumptions seem to creep in. And in Christianity, you know, <coughs> there's also the spiritual element, sort of. So there were, uh, Boff, for example, analyzes the sacraments in terms of economics and says that basically the church is the supplier of the sacraments and the consumers are the, uh, follow, you know, the followers, the devout. And that language can sometimes be a little bit problematic. Uh, so I think that might help to qualify maybe my previous statement in that we can't fully economize um, theology and we can't fully theologize the economy. And that's why I think the Vatican was very good at talking about at Vatican II that the church is apolitical, but it offers certain uh, <coughs> guiding principles that maybe Catholics could use to permeate society with their religious beliefs. Anecdotally, um, people, amazing people who come. 
come in and change the culture of a school and, and that sort of thing, but those are the, th the newspaper headlines, not what actually happens um, very frequently. And so there's so many different theories and um, ideas about how we solve this, because if you're a person who's on top of the wealth scale, you don't want all of these, these poor kids coming into your school who might bring down your learning environment. And if you're in the poor school, you know, you might not want to have to travel as far or you might not want to have to um, change really your entire life by having your kid go to a different school. And so it really comes down to the question of how do we maximize utility for all parties in that we get students who are economically deficient on free and reduced lunch into environments where they're encouraged and that it seems that you can overcome the adversity that you have in being poor by being around people perhaps who will stimulate ideas or who have different life experiences than you. Um, so in terms of my personal opinion on whether these teachers pay for performance programs work, it's not as much about how you pay the teachers, but more importantly about who is actually in the classroom with you. <laughs> I was reading um, Harry Potter with my daughter, and I, I said she was so smart, and I said, my parents told me that Harry Potter got a lot of emphasis to sort of take that new turn, where, you know, that just sort of like this destructive thing. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely the case. Um, and also in life, too. I know at the beginning of the school year, a lot of people go around the room, and you're supposed to introduce yourself. And sometimes it's an interesting fact, or um, your major, or your hometown. And so you're always providing these little tidbits of information. And so it's a really interesting um, idea to think about uh, how it reflects on the culture, um, how the questions you use reflects on the culture. and. Um, so yes, and that's what I uh, was sort of hinting at at the end is that so many of our, so much of our literature, our books and our movies right now uh, do center around finding the answer to one of these three questions if they aren't already known. Um, so they definitely are still relevant and um, the three questions themselves as well as the idea of having questions that are central to identity that might actually sound sim pretty simple, you know, that uh, open up a lot of realm for meaning, like I was talking about with what is your name, but on the surface, you know, what is your name, where are you from, who are your parents, it, it seems pretty basic. Um, so it is an interesting thing to, to take that into um, today's culture and think about, you know, how do these questions operate today and what other questions are at the forefront of um, our understanding of our identity. No, definitely, um, and that is part of the fact that they are rooted in the past. Um, you can't really change your parents and your home, and I mean, you can change your name, but you know, the concept is still there. Um, so you do have to sort of deal with the fact that uh, these are established qualities that um, these are things that are part of me, but they, like you said, they don't necessarily limit you. But um, you just have to think about how do they inform me about um, where I came from in a really broad sense, and then where can I go from that? Yeah, and then and one more thing, that's, that's a, um, a big part of knowing thyself, the idea of knowing yourself and um, using the knowledge that you have about yourself to help you direct mm -hmm. your path. Um, because it seems like you could be really lost in going down all kinds of crazy roads if you didn't have a good understanding of um, what, compri what composes your identity or where you came from or yourself. See 
seeing no other questions, I am going to invite Dean of the Library, Lynn Sutton, forward for the official award presentation. This is just about the happiest day of the year for a GFR library. We are so proud of the outstanding work that our students do, and it gives us great pride. And really, all we want to do is honor and promote your work across the campus and beyond. And so with the help of our friend Jemine Davis, who is the student that Molly mentioned, who said, you know, I'm in this honors thesis and my work isn't that good, but theirs is, and <laughs> somebody <laughs> needs to hear this. So we invented this event. And it was sort of the third leg of the three-legged stool, if you will, of the GFR strategy. At, at first, we reach out to our students and engage them with their freshmen and we invent these crazy games like humans <laughs> versus zombies and capture the flag so that they'll get to know us. And then we work with them all four years in group 100 and 200 and in reference work and social collection to help them be successful because our mission is to help you succeed, to help our students, faculty, and staff succeed. And then the third leg of that stool is to celebrate that success. And that's what we're here doing today. We, we invented this event called the Dean's Lit Gala. I'm sure none of you were in the <laughs> Dean's Lit, but maybe you were there in the atrium with, with uh, Quinn. But we're so proud of you. You do such good work, and we want to recognize that. So what I have here are, are envelopes with uh, checks for $1,000 each to each of you. And it just struck me as I was sitting there, there may be some controversy over that because I sort of pay for performance. <laughs> <laughs> and we could question the ethics of capitalism. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you would like to give it back to your advisor, if you'd like to donate it to the library, <laughs> if you'd like to give it to the poor, or if you'd like to, it's up to you. But it's, it's uh, supposed to be a material token of our esteem and our appreciation and uh, our gratitude for being such wonderful students that you are. So I would like you to come up. I don't know how this works. Do you take individual uh, pictures or do we can do that? <laughs> okay, so David and Kasia. Congratulations. You look at what you wrote. Okay. Okay. Christopher Earl. Enjoy. I think the panelists will be here for a while if you want to speak with them. I'd like to thank Molly and 